surrender um, the things that we have in our lives um, to you, Lord, and, and empty ourselves, Lord. Lord I pray that you, as we worship this morning, Lord, that um, you receive praise and honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Bring us 
sorrows and trade them for joys. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to.
Just thinking, the, the Old Testament says the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. The New Testament says where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. And so that the Lord is inhabiting this place, and in this place, then we welcome him as well. Amen? Amen. And all we do is to serve him and to love him. And uh, if you look in your bulletins, we have a lot of things going on to, that allow us to do that. I want to call your attention to just uh, a couple uh, because they're happening uh, this week. On Thursday, We Care Too is holding, as you can see, the Dr. Seuss birthday with Fun for Friends. And uh, one of the thrills, if I had off from work, I'd love to do this to come and read a Dr. Seuss story to these kids. If you've ever seen on Facebook the, uh, the picture of the kids who come to the daycare, they are cute, cute, cute. So if you want to have some fun, you want to, if you're grandma, grandpa especially, you would just be thrilled. So we encourage you to come out and uh, take part in that and be blessed. Also, you'll see in your bulletins a flyer for the Easter egg hunt. Uh, that's not coming up right away, but it needs candy right away so we can start stuffing the eggs. So if you uh, are, have a chance to get some, or doing some family shopping and you can get a bag of candy and drop it off here, um, we would really appreciate it for the Easter egg hunt. And then there are a number of other um, announcements that I'd like to uh, like you to look at while we have the um, ushers come forward. And let me ask a, a housekeeping question. Do we have any special music this morning? Anybody 
scheduled to do special music? No? Okay. All right, well then let's pray and uh, receive our offerings this morning. Father God, we, we thank you that every good gift that we receive every day comes from you. And we take this opportunity to return some of those gifts in the form of uh, financial blessings to you in the form of our tithes and offerings. We pray that you would accept them with our gladness, with our gratefulness, with our joy, and uh, use them to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Before you sit down, say good morning to one another. There we go. I not only can walk on water, but I can call down lightning and thunder. Boom. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. So, well, let's make sure it's tied in here tightly. Wow. I'm electrifying this morning. Make sure this is in tight. As I was saying, I think I got it now. Uh, as I was saying, so Matthew, Mark, Luke usually have the synopsis, have the same stories in them, and John is kind of trying to prove that Jesus Christ, that show that Jesus Christ is God, demonstrate that, so he's a little, his gospel is a little different. Today it's interesting because Luke does not include this story at all. It's absent from the book of Luke. It's in Matthew and Mark, but it's also in the book of John. So John includes this particular one. So as we're looking at it, and I, what I've done is I've taken, as I've gone through, I've taken the... the um, all the, all the four passages for all these sermons and looked at, compared them all and tried to include stuff from all of them. But I choose the, the gospel which has the most uh, prolific or the most volume of stuff about that particular thing to use as my text for the morning just to kind of go through as we're going through it. Matthew, um, well actually Mark has only eight verses on it. Okay, John who includes it has seven verses on it. But Matthew includes 12 verses on it. So uh, it's longer, and here's another interesting fact. Um, Peter, as we've talked before, 
probably had most influence with uh, John Mark. So John wound up being the one that wrote the Gospel of John, but it was a shorter one, and we think that that was probably, it's more like the Gospel of Peter, or the Gospel of Jesus Christ, written, uh, dictated by Peter and written by Mark. I don't know that he dictated it, but he had a lot of influence, we believe, on Mark when he wrote that. So it becomes interesting because Mark and um, the Gospel of John, thank you very much, both of those include the story but neither one of them include the story of Peter walking on the water. Why, why John Mark, influenced by Peter, does not include G Peter walking on the water in his gospel, I don't know. Maybe Peter was embarrassed by the fact that he sank in the water, so it didn't get included. Maybe he didn't want to say that he showed up the other disciples, uh, you know, by getting out of the boat. I don't know why, but it's not in the book of Mark and not in the book of John. Only the book of Matthew includes the story of Peter walking on the water. So today we're going to read the text together. I don't have the, the um, movie for you this morning to show you him walking on the water from the, uh, from the movie Jesus. We're going to read about it instead. So if you all stand with me, we're going to read from uh, Matthew chapter 14. And if you want to follow along in your Bibles, uh, if you have New American Standard, follow along in that one. If you don't, use one of the Pew Bibles because the Pew Bible will have different words. And while we don't say only one good translation is good enough, if you're going to read verbally, we need to be using the same translation, it's going to be muddled. So read from the screen up here or pick out one of the pew Bibles. And I'm going to ask we go back and forth, um, I think, men and women this morning. So how about if we do that? So we'll start off with the men with me. I'll read all the verses, but the men would join me for verse 22, women for 23, vice, uh, back and forth until we finish up. Ready? And the key again, read it loud enough so the person next, you can hear the person next to you. If you do that, it'll just come out perfectly. So don't be sheepish, you know, or timid about reading it, and uh, we'll go well. Then start with me. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage! It is I! Do not be afraid! Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come! And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. And let's take a look at this. And I'm going to go through this, uh, broke this down. And as I looked at the sections today, I came up with, um, I kind of divided into four different sections that I saw in the passages here today. So we're going to look through it. If you have your notes, pull them out um, and follow them along. Uh, there's a blank side on the back if you need to write, write some things. I'll make some quotes this morning of things that might be uh, interesting. So uh, fill these out. And, uh, of course, when you finish this series, I think I'll be doing probably the whole series myself at least at this point, it looks like. But you'll have uh, each one of those. You can put them down, and you'll have kind of a Bible study in the book of Peter if you want. Or not in the book of Peter, but in the life of Peter. So uh, save those along if you want, but fill them out. Um, at each one of these points I'm going to give you today, the four points, what I'm going to do is we're looking at the book of Matthew, so I'm just going to point out what is additional from the book of either Mark or from the book of John that's not included in Matthew, just to give you a little background as we look at the events of the story. So we just read the whole story, but if we're, the first uh, part I call alone time in prayer was Christ's priority. Alone time in prayer was Christ's prior priority. And as we look at this part, there's a couple things that uh, are additional in those other books. For instance, uh, it's um, the book of Mark says they were headed to Bethsaida, and uh, John said they were headed to Capernaum. Now, Bethsaida and Capernaum were right near each other, so uh, they were kind of at the one side of the lake, they were headed across to the other side of the lake near Bethsaida, Capernaum area. 
Um, the other thing that John points out is that the crowd that was with him there was trying to make him king. Now, if you look back at the prior story of this, you'll find out that just prior to this, Jesus Christ had fed the 5,000. Okay? So we have 5,000 people that got fed by how many loaves? No, so that was left afterwards. What did they start out with? Two loaves and five fish. Fed 5,000 people. Okay? And so all these people who are looking for the Messiah to come, they think, we got a guy that can feed us for free. You know? And so they, they wanted to make him king. I mean, he just, he just fed 5,000 people from a little boy's basket of lunch. So they, they wanted the, this guy to make him king. So John tells us they were trying to make him king. Jesus Christ tells the disciples, look, get in the boat, go across the lake toward, you know, with the Bethsaida, Capernaum area, you know, get, just get in and go out. I'll send the crowds away. Now, it's, it says in the text as we look here that they were kind of reluctant to leave. And we're not sure why they were reluctant to leave. Maybe they thought they wanted to be, just be with Jesus. Maybe they thought he was going to do another miracle and they'd miss out on something. Maybe they thought the crowds would be too much for him. I mean, after all, uh, these people want to make him king. They do did they want to say if they made him king, they didn't want to miss it, or they were afraid the crowd would uh, inundate him? Uh, also, it's interesting because Christ tells them to get in the boat. They were a little reluctant, and they did get in the boat and leave, but there was no boat left for Jesus. How's he going to get to Capernaum, you know? It's kind of, uh, this stuff didn't make sense to him. So I'm sure they had a bunch of perplexing, perplexing questions as we look at the text here as they got in and uh, moved alone. But Jesus needed time alone. He had just fed 5,000 people. The guys were probably exhausted. He was probably exhausted. He'd been teaching these people all day long. And he needed a rest. He needed to talk to God. And so he sent his disciples away so he'd get some alone time. Because even being with his good friends didn't mean being alone. You know, he was still teaching them all the time. And so he sent them alone, off. And he went alone to the mountain to pray. Now, if you look at rest in the scriptures, and we've talked about this before, but if you look at rest, we go back to the seven days of creation. God created the earth in how many days? And what did he do on the seventh? He rested. Now, God's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's all the omnis, everything, you know? I mean, did God need to rest? Was he tired out after creating the world? Oh, well, no, he wasn't tired. But he rested. And, I, and for some reason, God felt the need to rest. And it wasn't because he was exhausted or, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I don't know. But he had the need to rest. If God finds the need to rest, you know, important, we also do. And in fact, I think maybe God rested on the seventh day just to give us an example. Now, the law didn't come until many years later when he said rest on the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, or as we do one day of the week. We don't even do that anymore. <laughs> I got a phone call the other day. I just, I get more and more discouraged with the world. Well, that's the way it's going. I mean, Christianity and our impact in this nation is just going down, 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 you know. Um, Joshua, by the way, he, he bowls with the Special Olympics or bowls, bowls here every week. And he got, he went to the, yeah, there he is. He's got his medal on this morning. He wants to show everybody his medal. Give him, give him a hand. He got a gold medal. He got five spares in one game. So, um, at any rate, so they call. He's going to the regionals. Great. 12 o'clock noon on a Sunday. <laughs> Palm Sunday. Who does this stuff? You know? But the world, when I, I mean, we had rules when our kids were growing up. They didn't play any sports on Sundays at all. Jonathan actually, uh, we broke that rule once because we thought the team would probably lose without him, and we thought the testimony of him playing was probably more important than pulling him out and having them lose and blame him. Uh, you know, uh, for being a Christian, so we allowed him to play. It was an afternoon game, the f only time we ever allowed him to play on a Sunday. And our kids didn't play soccer because all the soccer teams were on Sundays. And I'm saying you have to follow this, but I mean, growing up, there wasn't ever even a question of that. You know, nowadays they they play their their uh, you know annual their uh, playoff games on Sundays. They practice on Sundays. They you know it's just it's the way the world's going. But I tell you. We're getting sucked into it. And again, if your kids play soccer or volleyball or basketball or baseball or something on those Sundays, I'm not, I'm not telling you how to live your life, but I'm just saying, we need a day of rest. And the world's taking away the day of rest. I mean, you work five days, 
They go home and work on the sixth day to try to get the house taken care of and so forth. On the seventh day, they got all kinds of sports events and other stuff to do. You know, and we, and we finish up church so we can go out to another soccer game and to another baseball game or something else. Something else. The rest is just gone. But the rest is important. And oftentimes we avoid rest. And, and part of rest for Jesus Christ in this passage was also time alone with God. And I'm not preaching to you as someone who's the greatest example. You know, as, as I think through this kind of thing, I think of Mary and Martha. You know, Mary was the one that did what? Sat at Jesus' feet, right? While Martha did what? <laughs> fixed everything up in the kitchen, you know? I'm probably a Martha. I would have been in the kitchen fixing things up. I, I would have loved to sat at Jesus' feet, but I'm thinking, boy, if both of us sit here, <laughs> nobody's going to get fed this afternoon. Uh, so I, I fight that kind of thing. But we need to be Mary's. We need to be learning. We need to be studying. When are you studying and learning for God? Are you part of a life group, maybe? Maybe that's where you're, maybe that's where you're getting, you're sitting at Jesus' feet and learning more. If you're not part of a life group, maybe you're, maybe you're attending a Sunday school class or a discovery class. Uh, maybe you have a personal Bible study. But to be honest with you, most of us are here on, this, on Sunday morning, so I'm preaching to the choir, I know. But probably most of us wind up leaving on Sunday afternoon, you know, doing our things during the week, and the next time we may be open to the Word of God sometimes is the following Sunday when we come to church. And we don't attend a life group, and we don't go to a Bible study or so forth. And I know a lot of you do, and we keep on, we keep on trying to encourage you to do that, and, and, I'm, and I'm excited about the, the, the volume of people in our church that do that. But for those who don't, we need to, and, and all of us, we just need to look at our lives and say, do we rest and spend time alone with God. Are we still learning or we stopped? Jesus, now Jesus didn't stop preaching to go spend time alone. I mean, he still preached, he still healed all the people, but those were those times when he just went into the mouth and prayed and took a break. Took a break. You know. I'm not going to do anything today, I'm going to rejuvenate. And we need to do that. My principle for this particular section, if you look on the screens they put it up, is take breaks, breaks to rest and pray alone with God. Take breaks to rest and pray alone with God. That was Jesus' example in this particular section. We begin the next part of the story, and I call this Jesus sees us in our distress and comes to us. Jesus sees us in our distress and comes to us. And as you look at the passage here, um, you, we, we read the Matthew passage, the things that are different in, in um, John, it tells us there were about 25 to 30 uh, stadia, furlongs or stadia out. That's about three to four miles out into the sea at the point in which uh, they were at this point of the uh, story. Uh, John tells us it was dark. The other ones tell us it was the fourth watch. Uh, Mark says that Christ saw them rowing in their distress. Now remember, Christ is on the mountain. Maybe he's walked down to the seashore, but with his omniscience, he sees them rowing in distress unless Mark's referring to as he walks them on the water, he sees them. But he sees them. He has them in his picture. He has them in view. They don't see him, necessarily. They don't know where he is, but he has them looking at them. He knows their situation. And then in Mark, it tells us that he was about to pass by. So he comes up to the boat, and he just kind of, he's about to pass by them. It's not like, I'm going to stop and see you guys. Uh, they, they thought it was a ghost, you know, um, a phantom. And actually, Phanasia, Fantasia is the, um, or phantasm is the Greek word for ghost or fantasy. And they thought that, and he was just kind of, I'm going to go, kind of take a walk and keep on going by. And that's what Mark tells us, different from the others. But Jesus spoke to them, and, and as we look at the events of the story here, um, they were three to four miles out. The fourth watch was three to six a.m. Now, he had probably dismissed them six p.m. the evening before. So these guys got on the boat at six at night, and it's at least three in the morning, which is how many hours later? Nine hours later. They've been rowing, and they've been in the storm. I don't know how much of the time it didn't start right off, but they've been in the storm for a while. So it's 3 a.m. These guys are tired. They spent a whole day with Jesus. They haven't slept. They're on the boat, and they wind up in the middle of the storm, and they're trying to row to get themselves out of this predicament. And so that's the situation we find them here. And I, and I suggest that Jesus delayed coming to them. I mean, he's there praying on the mountain, so he, I guess he prayed to maybe around 3 a.m., but he could have come earlier, but he didn't. Did he delay on purpose? I don't know. But he had his eyes on the guys, and he knew they were rowing hard. They knew they were in trouble, and he didn't go to them. He delayed. And as we talked about last week, as we were talking about the hemorrhaged woman in the, uh, who delayed Jesus getting to Jairus' daughter, 
we find that God sometimes sticks delays in our path. And sometimes they're divine delays. He knew the pearls when he sent them out there, but he delayed them. He allowed the problem to come for a purpose. Maybe they wanted to stay at the shore and not leave him because they might even want to see another miracle. And yet, by leaving, they were going to see maybe one of the greatest miracles of all. Jesus walking on the water toward them. And they thought it was a ghost. He saw them in their distress. And, you know, sometimes when we get down, when distress comes our way, we don't think God's got us on his radar. Anybody ever feel like that? You know, like God's forgot me, you know, I mean, I'm out here on my own kind of thing. And what we don't realize is God always has us on his radar. In Psalm 139, it says this, uh, for, for 137, verses 7 through 12. Where can I go from your presence? This is David writing, and you know he's had a lot of problems in his life. Psalm 137, where can I go from your, from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol or hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and if I dwell in the remotest parts of the seas, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay a hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light will surround me as the night, even the darkness is not dark to you, God. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. We're living in darkness sometimes, but darkness and light are the same to God. He doesn't need the light on in order to see where he's going. And he can guide us through the dark, but David understands that any place he is, he can't leave God. God can find him. He can't run away from God. And then there's that verse in, um, in uh, Hebrews, uh, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Um, you know, he says, And are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. The very heads of your hair are all numbered. That's a little easier for him in my case, but some of yours uh, might be a little harder. But very heads of your hairs are all numbered. So do not fear. Are you not vari more valuable than many sparrows? Do you think you're more valuable than a lot of sparrows? If a s one single sparrow can't fall without him knowing, how can you go through the trials without him being right there? We don't always feel like he's there, but he's there. If there's a low in your life, you're feeling depressed, overwhelmed, helpless, hopeless, you know, uh, just discouraged, depressed, whatever it might be. However you feel, whatever the problem, Jesus is the answer. He's the answer. He's the, there's only one answer to it all. Jesus is with you. Now, there might be other solutions that are possible, but we get into our own problems when we shoulder the problems ourselves. When we try to do it our own, that's when we get into problems. We give them over to Jesus, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, what? With prayer and supplications, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guide your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We get to those points in our life. Jesus appeared to walk by. He wasn't going to stop. Or so it seemed. And they looked, and they thought they saw a ghost. And, and we're told that what did they see? What did they recognize about him? Not as, not as his, his physique or his being, they recognized his voice. They recognized his voice. Reminds me, I was, uh, I was at a church conference. So I, looked, uh, I still have people coming up saying, boy, it's the first time I've seen you without your beard. You look different, you know. Uh, when I started growing it, there was a, I went down to a Florida church conference. Uh, pastor Ken and I had gone the last few years in, in November, and some friends from Keswick, the pastor friends that we know, were down at the conference. And um, I, you know, being in a different place like Florida, you know, you don't expect to see people you know there, so I didn't pick them out right away. But they saw me, and they said, uh, you know, they, they thought they recognized me, but they, or, or there was something familiar about me. They didn't know. But we went to a, we were in a class, and as normal, I'm the one that asked the questions, you know. I always feel bad, even, for, even if I don't know a question, I make up a question. If the, if the poor guy's standing up there and says, well, any questions, and everybody's kind of staring them back at him. So I'll generate a question hoping he gets things started. So in this case, I think I actually asked the one that I really wanted to hear. And I, I asked the question, and as soon as I spoke, they knew who I was. They couldn't recognize me, but they recognized my voice. Um, I was down here on Harrison, uh, Harrison Avenue one, uh, a couple years ago, um, and um, I was uh, shoveling the walk and for, for a place that uh, was down there. And um, I, I saw someone down there. It was your sister-in-law, is it, Ron? Uh, Cheryl. 
I, she was down there, and, and I didn't really didn't want to, I, don't tell her this, I really didn't want to be bothered, I just wanted to help out this lady, she was trying to get this older lady's car out, so I thought, well, let me help her, I said, um, I said so I started to help her, you know, and uh, I, I said, do you want to help in, and I had, I had that coat that has the thing that comes way down here, you know, and so you can't see anything out, and so I'm, I'm just, I, oh, I said, can I help you, and I, I started doing it, and uh, no way you could tell who I was, all of a sudden, is that you, Pastor Taylor? I said, how did you know it was me? She said, I recognized your voice. All I said was, you want some help, you know? She recognized my voice. But that's the way it is with Jesus at this point. They didn't recognize me, but the voice of Jesus they heard, and they recognized it. And it says he calls us by name, you know? Um, do we hear, I mean, we, we don't hear physically God's voice, but we hear it in God's word. And they recognized his voice. And what did he say to them? Three things. And I, frankly, what time is it? I could do a whole sermon on just these three words. You know, when I started this sermon, I thought, walking on water, what's it say about that? He walked on the water. You all know the story. I mean, I, don't, I can't develop a sermon out of that, you know? But then I saw these three words, these three phrases, and I thought, man, I could develop a whole sermon just out of those as I thought about them. He said three things to them. First of all, he said, take heart or take courage. They were dejected. He said, take heart, take courage. I think of the Wizard of Oz, right? Who needed courage? The lion. The lion needed courage. And what? How do you give him courage? What do you give him? Didn't he give him a badge of courage? Give him that. You know, he says, military people with badges, you know, awards and everything. And, you, you know, you needed a award to say that you've got courage, you know. And they gave him, a, gave him an award. Well, these guys needed courage. They needed to. And, and what's the Christian's badge of courage? A lot of us wear. If I look around, you'll probably find a necklace that has it hanging on this morning. The cross of Christ. The cross gives us courage. You th Jesus, Peter was one of the, you, you look at him before the cross. I mean, we'll, we'll see him a few times as we talk about here, denying Christ and all this other stuff. You look at Jesus, Paul, uh, excuse me, you look at Peter after the resurrection, and you almost don't recognize the guy. Why? The cross of Christ and the resurrection changed him. That was his badge of courage. He says, take courage, take heart. And the second thing he says to them, it is I. It is I. Now, you see a ghost. Someone says, it's, it's, it's me. It's I. Well, you know, if I think you're a ghost, I mean, if I say, it's Jesus, you know, you tell me who it is, you know. It's Gary, you know, or it's Pastor Gary. I mean, tell me who you are, but it's I, you know. That's all I have to say. And they recognize his voice. The other thing that's interesting, the, the t where, where else, uh, he says, it is I, or I, I am, basically. And as you look at the Old Testament, at the burning bush, and uh, Moses wants to know, who should I tell the Israelites sent me? And God says, what should you tell them? I am sent you. I am sent you. And so I think there's a, I don't even know if there's a play on words. I think it, was, it might be, have been pretty obvious to them, you know, when he said, it is I. I am. It's me. I think that, that relationship to it's, it's me. And at the very end of Matthew, they say, you are the Son of God. I think they, they finally are starting to get it, who he is. In Matthew chapter 28, and, and, and I am is ever-present, is, is what I'd say that is. It's, it's the continuous present tense. It's not, I will be with you, or I was with you. It is, I am with you all the time, 24-7. Matthew 28, 20, the, the Great Commission says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He promised this constant being with us. John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father, and he will send you another comforter or helper, that he may be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is with us forever. Where will you be Monday night? Jesus will be there with you. Where will you be Tuesday night? Jesus will be there with you. Where will you be after work? Where will you go after work? Wherever it is, Jesus will be with you. He will be there at that location. Wherever you go, you're taking Jesus with you, which is sometimes why I think we need to walk that, that little word, you know, oh, be careful little eyes what you see, or be careful little feet where you go, or, you know, because you're taking the Holy Spirit with you wherever you go, and he is there with you. When you're standing in the break room having a conversation with your fellow workers, He's there, listening, right there. 
And the third thing he said is do not be afraid. Free, free, fear is often what paralyzes us. Fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of not succeeding, fear of what others may think. There's all kinds of fears. A lot of the stuff we don't do, we don't do because we're fearful of it. You know, we're fearful that we can't do a good job. We can't get an A in the class. We can't do all three projects done at the same time, you know, whether it's work or school or whatever. We, we have fear. And uh, Tim Gray, one of the guys I was reading, says, fear is the enemy of faith. How true. Fear is the enemy of faith. Jesus Christ told him, do not be afraid. It's I. And if we can just recognize it's I that's with us, we don't have to worry about being fearful or being afraid. The principle of God is always watching over us, even when we can't feel him there. God is always watching over us, even when we can't feel him there. Third, Peter sees Jesus during Peter's distress and moves toward him. Peter sees Jesus during his distress and moves toward him. A couple of observations. Peter says to Jesus, now, you remember the scenario? Heavy winds, they're wondering if they're going to die here in the middle of the ocean. They see a ghost. He says, it is I. Peter recognizes him. He says, and if it is you, command me to come. I think that's interesting. If it is you, command me to come. We, we kind of gloss over that. Peter was not going to get out of the boat until Jesus told him to get out of the boat. He wanted Jesus' confirmation that you want me to get out of the boat. Tell me to come, and I will come. And when Jesus said come, he obeyed we got to make sure that we're not jumping out of the boat without Jesus there by our side. You know, sometimes we run ahead of God, you know, and God's saying, trying to say, wait, but just take our time and recognize, ask you, God, do you want me to do this? And i got to think, what are the other disciples thinking, okay? Here's, here's, here they are. They're scared to death. They're about to die. <laughs> I think they're about to die. And here's Peter. He says, tell me to come, Lord, if it's you. And I th the left guy there, I mean, they're trying to say, Peter, stay on the boat. What are you doing? You're jumping out. Don't get out of the boat. I mean, you're crazy. You're a lunatic. I, I don't know what they're thinking, but I'm sure they think he's crazy. I mean, they just thought they saw a ghost, and this guy says, come to me, and he's going to step out of the boat. I mean, the boat's about to sink anyway, you know, but, you know, don't get out of the boat. I'm sure they were thinking that. But he had this, this trusting nature, almost like a child, you know. I mean, my grandson Jason, I, can, I throw him up in the air, and I can catch him, you know, and he seems okay with that, you know. Um, I'll catch them. The trusting nature of a child, and all of us have that experience where uh, kids will trust us. Why they, why they try to get kids to not trust adults in some cases because some adults aren't trustworthy. But kids, children will trust. And unfortunately, sometimes we will not trust. Here's a quote. Unfortunately, I thought this is from the same guy I quoted before. Unfortunately, instead of acting like children who completely trust in their parents, we usually start thinking like adults. We play it safe and carefully. That's us. You know, sometimes brand new Christians are the best ones because by the time you've been around a while, you just kind of get into this, you know, thing. Uh, brand new Christians are excited about their faith. They're exuberant. They want to tell everybody. They're, 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 just, they're like a little child with something new. But then us old guys, you know, that have been believers for a long time, we just kind of Oh, I'm going to go to church, you know, it's just the add-on thing, you know. If the pastor dies in the pulpit, that might excite me because that's something new. But other than that, you know, it's just same old stuff, you know. We just kind of plod along. Peter took his, off, his eyes off Jesus, and he saw the wind, and fear got to him. There's two problems that, noted, that are noted here. First of all, he took his eyes off Jesus. Take your eyes off the ball. We start looking at the things that when we, when we take our eyes off Jesus, that's the first problem when he doesn't have that place in our life. And that's why I think Jesus went to the mouth of the prey. He wanted to keep his eyes focused, not on the crowds, not on the guys, not on the disciples. Not on, he wanted to make sure he was focused on God. And the second thing he did is he became afraid by looking at the immediate circumstances. Despite taking his eyes off of Jesus, this is interesting, Jesus never took his eyes off of Peter. In spite of the fact that Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, Peter, oh, Jesus never took his eyes off Peter. When you're in distress, what gets you into trouble? Is it taking your eyes off Jesus? Is it looking at your circumstances? What 
and get everything happening around you, get you down. There's all kinds of stuff that can affect us. And we take our eyes off Jesus and start looking at circumstances. John MacArthur is one of the ones I love to read. He has two quotes here, and I'm going to quote them because I think they're, they're really brilliant. Um, and I, I like them, and I agree with them. His faith was enough to get him out of the boat, but it was not enough to carry him across the water. Peter's faith was enough to get him out of the boat, but not enough to carry him across the water. We start out doing well, but then sometimes we see the stuff around us and our faith starts to wane and we kind of stop partway through. The other thing he said <laughs> is, I think is really brilliant, Peter's weak faith was better than no faith. Peter's weak faith was better than no faith. He, when he started saying, he said, Lord, save me. He knew whose name to call on. It was Jesus. And it says Jesus stretched out his hand and took him. He knew whose name to call. What's your first reaction when you begin to sink? You know? I mean, mine oftentimes is, you know, what can I do to get out of the situation? How can I fix this? What paper to do first? You know, get my things to do list. But our first thing would be, God, <laughs> help me. God, save me. You know, now I do need to look at my list of what needs to be done, but our first reaction should be, God, save me. And that's what Peter said, Lord, save me. Do you ever rely on yourself and doubt God? That's what he, he picked up Peter, and then he, he said, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? It was a fair scolding to Peter. He had doubted. He had started to sunk. He could have done so much more. But he was the only one that got out of the boat. He was the only one that got out of the boat. What would have you done in that situation? Would have you asked Jesus to come, ask you to come on the water? Or would you have stayed in with the boat with the other guys? Would have you walked on the water? Would you have taken your eyes off? The principle I have is God desires that we get out of the boat and walk on water with him. God desires that we get out of the boat and walk on water with him. And I've got one more quote here that I've got to throw in from John MacArthur that I think is so good. You might want to write this one down. It's so good. It is safer to be with Jesus on the water than to be without him in the boat. It's better to be with Jesus and on the water than without Jesus in the boat. Isn't that good? Lastly, Jesus brings calm to the midst of our storms. As we look at this uh, next section here, the last section, um, the two things that come from other, from other sources, John said they were immediately at land. When Jesus got on the boat, not only did the wind calm, but they were immediately at land. Now, they're three to four miles out, but it's like as soon as the wind calmed, he got him right to the shore. That was another miracle that we don't even think about, but it was a part of it. And then Mark says they were amazed and didn't understand because of their hard hearts. Now, Matthew says they said he was the Son of God. But Mark consistently, and, and if you look through Mark, consistently says they had hardened hearts. They didn't understand. And the verse in, Ma in Mark actually says this, For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. You know, he just fed 5,000 people on the shore with, with this little stuff, and they collected back 12 basketfuls afterwards. And now they're in trouble on the water, and they completely forgot about the loaves and the fishes. They didn't learn. Their heart got hardened, or they, they really couldn't understand that what he did there, he could continue to do here. Because he not only is in charge of the food, but he's in charge of the weather, he's in charge of our lives. And they didn't take that, the lessons from one place and transfer it to another. And sometimes we don't do the same thing, do we? We take lessons from one place, we never transfer it to the other. But God wants us. God wants us to be able to walk on water with him. Jesus could have kept the storm from coming, correct? He could have kept them safe by never having the storm come. He didn't do that. When you get into storms, don't think that it's necessarily there because God was not in control or Jesus could have kept it. It may be there because God wants you to go through that storm. He wants to be able to save you and teach you a lesson. God wishes to allow storms sometimes to teach us those valuable lessons. And for this fourth point, the principle I have is invite Jesus into your boat in both calm and windy waters. Invite Jesus into your boat in both calm and windy waters. Don't wait for the winds to get so bad that you're now, oh, Jesus, come get in my boat with me. 
you know. He should be able to be invited there anytime. When it's clear sailing, he should be sailing with you. When the waters get rough, he should be there with you. In another storm they had, Jesus was in the boat with them. The storm was there. And they went and woke him up. Jesus, don't you care that, I, that we're going to drown? Well, you know, they didn't understand. They weren't going to drown as long as it was Jesus in the boat. He woke up and he said, oh, he just, stop. And the wind stopped. They really didn't understand that Jesus can take us through the storms, the problems, the depressions, the difficulties, and he can help us, and, and he can help us avoid them all entirely. If he doesn't avoid them all entirely, it may be that he wants to teach us something as we walk through them. So the next time we have a problem, we know we can get through it. As we come to the Lord's table today, I want to share with you that the only way to walk on water is to get out of the boat. The only way to walk on water is to get out of the boat. I don't know where your faith is today. I don't know if you're going through a rough time, a hard time, a depressed time, a, an overwhelmed time, a discouraging time, a time of illness, or if you've got clear sailing ahead of you. But regardless of which it is, make sure that if Jesus invites you to get out of the boat with him, it's safer to be walking on the water with him than to be into the boat. I'd be willing to take that step to get out of the boat. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your love for us. We we go through these discouraging times in our lives sometimes, and it gets us down and discouraged and tight, and we get overwhelmed and, we feel, and this kind of thing. And, and sometimes that's true. And yet, we need to just take some time, rest, talk to you, say, God, we put it in your hands. We know you're in charge. And now help us to attack this issue, this problem, this challenge in a way that would be pleasing to you. Take us through the rough waters even if it means getting out of the boat. And help us to recognize that when Jesus Christ says, take courage, it is I, do not fear, that that is just as much words for us. And the badge of courage that we wear is the cross of Jesus Christ, which we come to this morning. As we come to this table, cleanse our hearts, take away sin that we are willing to confess, Help us to conquer depression. Help us to conquer overwhelmed feelings. Help us to conquer uncertainty in what's going on in the future and just say, God, it's in your hands. No matter what the decision or where I go or what the challenge, I know you can handle it. So why should I worry? Let me plan, but you determine the outcome. As we partake today of the bread, we ask that you might help us to remember that you suffered yourself harder than any of us in this room will ever suffer, I bet. The thorns on your head, I can't imagine the feeling, the, the whips across the back, the open flesh, walking to the cross, hanging on the uh, nails going through your hands, excruciating pain as we think of the bread that we partake. Our trials are so insignificant compared to that. And you can take us through them all. As we partake of the bread, help us to remember your suffering. And may that give us courage to move forward without fear. For it is I.
took the bread and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat you all. You didn't just suffer that pain and anguish for us, dear Lord, but you gave up your blood, which means you died. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You went to the ultimate sacrifice because you loved us so much. You paid for our sins. We pray if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you as their personal Savior, that today they might remedy that situation and trust you and recognize that their sin can only be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, your blood that was shed on the cross of Christ. Calvary. But for those of us who do know you, we pray that you might help us to truly appreciate your debt and our future. May we take our eyes off of our current circumstances, keep them focused on you, and recognize that everything that we do here will be fade into history as we enter heaven. And so it's allow us to learn from the challenges, learn from the delays, learn from the disappointments, and be able to accept your blood as the promise of eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus' name. took the cup in the same manner. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for forgiveness of sins. Drink you all.